In this chapter, we'll be discussing self-concept, self-esteem, image management, and self-disclosure. Self-concept is the set of stable ideas that a person has about who he or she is. We might also refer to this as identity. Now, there are a couple of different ways we might examine self-concept, the first of which is objectively. Objective implies more of a reality-based than subjective, and this might involve how other people see us, or a realistic appraisal of ourselves, whereas subjective is more of a personal appraisal that is viewed through the lens of ourselves and may be either realistic and somewhat objective or more subject to our own interpretation. An example of this might be an individual who is an auto mechanic. Other people may perceive this auto mechanic as a fine mechanic able to fix, uh, fix automobiles, be very successful in this, and very competent. Now, subjectively, the mechanic might look at himself with anxiety and say, I'm worthless, I'm not able to do this job, and it may motivate him to do his work and to be excellent. There are two different appraisals of the same individual, and the objective self-concept, again, is more reality-based and how others might perceive uh, the individual. And subjective is our own, own interpretation of who we are. The self-concept may change over time due to major life events, and that could be death of a loved one, and role change trauma and religious experience. A healthy concept of, or a healthy self-concept is apt to change over time. Another way of examining self-concept is uh, by way of this Jahari window. This window is divided into four panes, the first of which is the open free area. Now this is the self-concept, this is the way that we present ourselves to the world. This is all the common information about us, and that is like our name, our gender, our occupation, and some of the basics that we would share, perhaps in an elevator with a stranger. In pane two, this is called the blind area. Now this is concepts, uh, components of ourself that we possess, but we may not be aware of. We may not be aware of the impact that we have on others. Uh, and an example of this might be that we feel that we are direct, but in reality, other people view us as rude. A third would be a hidden area. Now these are things that we are aware of in ourselves, but that we don't reveal to others. These, these may be secrets, these may be beliefs that we have that are not publicly popular, uh, whatever, but they're things that we know about ourselves that we don't wish others to, others to know. And the fourth pane is the unknown area. And this is an area that is comprised of areas that may be blind to us or blind to others. These could involve uh, future events that we have never had to respond to, that we don't know how we might react, things like this. Now let's explore the development of self-concept. There are several things that may contribute to the development of self-concept, and let's take a, take a look at some of these individually. The first of which may be personality and biology. Personality, of course, is the way that we react to the world in general, and bio biology is our our individual makeup. The way that we react to the world could certainly contribute to our self-concept and understanding who we are and how we fit in the world. Our biology, including uh, perhaps the way that we look, the way that we appear to others, any developmental disabilities, anything like this, uh, any biological traits that we may possess can also contribute to our self-concept or our own personal identity. Culture and gender roles also contribute to self-concept. Uh, differing cultures place differing amounts of importance on the self versus uh, group. May also, your culture may exist within a larger culture that does not approve of, does not support your culture, and your self-concept may either increase or decrease. We'll explore that a little bit more in a, in a future slide. Gender roles can certainly also contribute to self-concept. The idealized gender roles of male and female and how we possibly fit into those gender roles I'm not man enough or I'm not woman enough can certainly also contribute to self-concept. The reflected appraisal and social comparison. Now this talks about how we believe that we are seen through others eyes. 
and uh, you know the the understanding that other people like me or dislike me can certainly contribute to self concept. Now, comparison to reference groups, and this is how I, as an individual, I identify myself with a group, and I compare myself to that group, or I compare myself to an idealized group, and that is something that I see that is perhaps outside of my immediate uh, my immediate social world and I compare myself this might be an example of young women comparing themselves to women that they see that are supermodels on the runway and considering themselves to be inadequate because they don't appear just like some of those models part of being a skilled communicator is awareness of your self-concept and managing its influences on your behavior now this is uh, the importance of understanding how you see yourself and not allowing that to interfere with the way that you interact with other people or if it does understanding how that might be there are a couple concepts within this idea and the first is self-monitoring self-monitoring as we explored I believe in chapter one is the awareness of how one's behavior might affect others now there the, the general public can be divided people can be divided into one of two categories and that would be high self monitors and low self monitors high self monitors tend to be more aware of how they present themselves and how they are perceived by others uh, very high self monitors um, examples of these might be politicians who are very aware how every nuance of the way that they speak and their hand motions the way that they interact with others how all of these might impact the way that they are perceived Low self-monitors generally aren't concerned with how they are seen by other people unless they are uh, confronted with, with their appearance or whatever. A classic example of this is perhaps your long-haired uh, physics professor who is far more interested in physics and science than how he might appear to the class. Another concept is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now this is an expectation that gives rise to behaviors that cause the expectation to come true. An example of this might be a young man interested in asking a young lady out, but having in his mind that she is not going to like me. Uh, this girl, I'm going to ask her out, but she doesn't like me, and so he approaches her with this, she's not going to like me, and she's probably going to say no. In his head, he, he speaks very awkwardly, uh, can't find the words, and he presents himself as having uh, very low poor self concept and uh, very self defeating and she of course responds that no I'm not interested due to this he may even be sending conflicting messages there are all kinds of applications for self fulfilling prophecies with uh, moving into new situations it could be applying for a job and not feeling or having a low sense of self worth of self concept and when applying for the job that comes across and walking into uh, a, a, an interview with the mindset that I'm not going to get this job could um, just having that mindset could actually manifest the reality of not getting the job now image management and face these two concepts um, would be especially prevalent for those who are higher self monitors and our image is the way that we wish uh, to be perceived by others image management is the process of projecting ones desired public image and we might see this in, uh, in a variety of arenas but especially political campaigns the, the, this image management is very common for those who are running for office and there are people who specialize in maintaining and developing public image as well as handling attacks to public image so you will see sometimes in the news especially during the presidential elections uh, smearing campaign smearing ads by opposing politicians and those ads are aimed at uh, decreasing the public image um, so image management again is, is uh, protecting that and, uh, and and focusing on one's public image the uh, face is your desired public image some of this stuff is confusing and I'm not terribly concerned with with how in depth of an understanding you have but this this material is contained in your text and it may appear on one of your exams. The, uh, the third bullet here I've included is consider how you dress and how this is related to managing your own image. Now I have, uh, I'm a counselor and I've worked with a number of folks and some younger people who dress um, 
one, one I think of in particular, one who dressed uh, like a punk, a punk rocker, and he was commonly mistaken for a white supremacist because he had, um, you know, a shaved head and wore um, clothes that might, some people might perceive as a white supremacist, high top uh, Doc Martin boots and suspenders and, and, and this, and you know, he, he had a hard time understanding why people either thought of him as a white supremacist or just kind of stayed away from him. And he managed his own self-image, and he was trying to portray something, and it was misperceived uh, by a lot of folks. But we all dress, to some extent, to manage our own self-image. And uh, Now, what about your social media profile image, your Facebook image? What We all take a moment, generally, to pick a Facebook image on our, our home page to uh, something that we feel may be indicative of us or that is important to us. So consider why you chose the image that you did for your Facebook profile. Let's move into an exploration of self-esteem. Self-esteem is one's subjective evaluation of one's own worth as a person. So again remember that subjectivity is the uh, personal appraisal from, from within the individual as opposed to objective. So one subjective evaluation of, of one's worth as a person. Am I worth, or, or what am I worth to myself, to, to the world at large? Now how do you feel about yourself, your looks, your personality, relationships, and social standing? Do you feel comfortable with who you are? All of these are questions which we might ask when exploring self-esteem. Now, I pulled some facts from the text that I felt were interesting with regard to self-esteem. Higher self-esteem, or folks with high self-esteem, is positively correlated with confidence, increased ease of forming new relationships, increased beliefs of genuineness of others' love, and increased sexual behavior. All of these can fall under the umbrella of of a higher confidence, strongly related to higher self-esteem. Lower self-esteem is positively correlated to anxiety, depression, and loneliness, as well as challenges in understanding one's own emotions, a difficult time knowing how one feels. Very common with folks with lower self-esteem. Now take a moment to appraise your own self-esteem. Do you feel that you fall into uh, one, of, one of these two categories, you have higher self-esteem or lower self-esteem. If it's higher, it's important to beware some of the pitfalls and acknowledge that others may struggle with their self-esteem issues. It's common for folks with high self-esteem maybe to not be so aware that others don't always operate on the same level that they do. And I know folks with higher self-esteem that can be frustrated when dealing with other people with lower self-esteem and why can't they just pull themselves up by the bootstraps and why can't they they just succeed well, it's important to acknowledge that not everybody feels as good about themselves as you might it is important to feel good about oneself and I'm not trying to minimize that if your self-esteem is lower I believe it's important to acknowledge this and perhaps work to improve it as we've explored higher self-esteem has a lot more benefits to it than lower self-esteem you might engage in therapy, you might work to challenge yourself, you might work to um, build some successes in your life. All of these things can contribute to increasing your self-esteem. Now I've also included some myths about self-esteem here. These are some commonly held myths that people, uh, people talk about and they, they might identify somebody with some of these characteristics and say, Oh, she has low self-esteem, and that's why she, why she does that. So again, these are myths. These are falsehoods about self-esteem. People with low self-esteem are more likely to abuse drugs and, vi uh, and alcohol, to be violent, and to engage in risky sexual behavior. I can think of a, of a girl when I was in high school um, who was uh, engaging in very risky, unprotected sex with uh, multiple partners and, and the common common sentiment there was, wow, that girl must have really low self-esteem. She really must not care about herself. Now, we could argue that point one way or the other. But, uh, low self-esteem also contributes to poor academic and work performance, and this is absolutely not true. Uh, as I discussed earlier with the mechanic, uh, with his um, skewed self-appraisal, his subjective uh, self-appraisal, he may have had low self-esteem. 
but he was an excellent mechanic. And I believe that this is more, uh, more than the reality, more than the object of appraisal. It's more about the subject of appra uh, subjective appraisal and how we integrate the information into, uh, into ourselves. So because I am good at work, I may still have a low self-esteem. I may have a negative self-message that I tell myself, and this may motivate me to, uh, to excel at work. And sometimes we see these, these people that just feel awful about themselves with their amazing employees, and, and we can't understand why that is, or they may be amazing students. Uh, minorities, marginalized groups, have lower self-esteem. Now, this is absolutely not true. Some marginalized groups, um, especially people with gender identity issues, um, may have lower uh, lower self-concept because of the fact that they are not as uh, accepted within society. Now, within minority cultures, it has been found that in general, uh, folks of minority cultures, African Americans, um, Hispanic Latinos, uh, Native Americans, they may actually have, in general, higher self-esteem than non-Hispanic Caucasians. And why this is, is that there may be a stronger sense of self-concept, and generally when we are examining self-esteem, we will be comparing ourselves more to members within our own culture than uh, members from other cultures. And we are more likely, minorities are more likely to prize their strengths rather than their weaknesses and uh, competitiveness and such. Finally, uh, another myth about self-esteem is that it's not always helpful to work uh, to boost an individual's self-esteem. I think of the, the typical coach who really works to um, get in there and, and uh, encourage the young basketball player to get out on the floor and to, to really try to work. And uh, when in reality the self-esteem uh, may be more negatively impacted um, by by having this external pressure on it. And once again, it's more about the way that the individual integrates the uh, the incoming knowledge, the incoming information, the incoming challenges. It's uh, our personality really feeds into the self-esteem. The self and interpersonal needs. Now these are the things that every individual here, and we can speak broadly for, for people throughout the world, every individual has certain needs. The first of which is need for control. Everybody, to some extent, has a need for autonomy in our lives and relationships. This may vary slightly with uh, individualistic versus collectivistic cultures, but in general, we all want to feel that we are in some, in some way in control of our lives and our ability to, uh, to experience and navigate our relationships. We each feel a need for inclusion or a need to belong. We have an innate need to be a part of a group. Being a part of a group, um, historians and sociologists have, have identified that our ability to group as humans has helped us to thrive. Uh, we don't naturally, you know, to go back to, uh, say, living, living in a forest, as, as some of our uh, ancestors may have done. As an individual, a human uh, may not be as successful um, against elements such as uh, wild beasts and such, but you put us together in a group, we have the ability to, to communicate with one another. Um, we could, it certainly becomes evident how we could overcome our environment. Also, this need for inclusion, um, you will find this manifested all over, um, within, without family groups, maybe political affiliations. Um, we can uh, see this played out in gangs. Um, the need to belong, not only for protective factors, but the need to identify with others and the need to feel that one belongs to a group. A, um, it's an innate need. It's something that is within all of us, unless we're completely antisocial. Uh, finally, the need for affection, and that is simply the need to give and receive love and appreciation. Now, this may vary in certain individuals, but at the end of the day, all of us have an innate need for affection. Now, self-disclosure is a concept uh, which is the, the act of giving others information about oneself that one believes they do not already have. I'm not crazy about this definition, but uh, I teach in a psychology department, and it's not uncommon for the first day of class to have a student that will go into detail about personal experiences. Uh, the, the rest of the class may become uncomfortable by this. Um, 
and this this individual is uh, doing self-disclosure as a therapist uh, they're doing inappropriate self-disclosure now as a therapist I sometimes will self-disclose uh, bits about myself as I feel that they may be helpful to a client maybe my own personal struggles with depression in the past or some family issues that I can relate with and uh, and in the next slide, we'll explore some of the risks and benefits to self-disclosure. This is ideally a gradual process. As one gets to know uh, someone else, uh, the, the increase of self-disclosure is, is appropriate and likely. Now let's explore the benefits, benefits and risks of self-disclosure. Benefits might include building trust and strengthening relationships with others encouraging self-disclosure of others and that's just simply getting to know and sharing mutual stuff uh, emotional release and helping others as I had described being a therapist I use self-disclosure as a way of allowing others to identify with me so that I might help them work through some of their their personal issues there are risks also involved with self-disclosure and that is the chance of rejection of hurting others and of violating others privacy and of course gossip sharing intimate details about yourself with another person uh, allows them a possible opportunity to to share that information with others now hurting others is something that I wanted to touch upon and uh, I work with uh, with folks who struggle with substance abuse and it's not uncommon for for some of these folks to have uh, done some some pretty serious um, misdeeds in the past some pretty serious wrongs and when they get sober, it's very common for, for them to want to assuage their own sense of guilt, to, uh, to relieve their own sense of guilt by sharing some of the things that they have done, by self-disclosing some, some of the deeds that they have done. Now, this may be uh, uh, telling their families especially, and this may be very, very hurtful to, to family members. Uh, it is important to self-disclose this information in an appropriate venue perhaps not with the family, but that's what hurting others involves. There are some risks, I want to explore this briefly, risks online of self-disclosure. And, and uh, an example that comes to mind is um, a, a family sharing on Facebook that they are getting ready to, to leave to go out of the country for 10 days. Now, anybody who is a friend on their Facebook feed might un might might see that they're not going to be home for 10 days. Now, perhaps a friend of a friend sees this as well as uh, their friend commented on it, and this friend of a friend may be a thief, and they are going to know that this uh, family will not be home for, for 10 days, and they will have free access to this person's house. Um, so there's a risk there. Um, sharing your personal information. Uh, this could be simple, simple information as your birthday or, or whatever, but Sharing personal information online gives uh, access to a, a variety of, of businesses and individuals we see on Facebook that when we, we like something, perhaps uh, businesses will identify an opportunity to be able to market directly to us. Another uh, risk that has is, is, uh, become more prevalent and more well-known here is cyberbullying, and that is especially common with, uh, with folks in high school and with folks in university, and that is uh, sharing personal information and that information being used against them. Um, it's, it's not all that cyberbullying entails, but it's certainly a part of it. Now, there's a, a link to an article that I included here on, on self-disclosure, on potential risks of self-disclosure online that you might be interested in. This is not a required reading. Uh, this will not be on your exam, but if, if, uh, if you're interested in this, self-disclosure and managing your, uh, your privacy online. I, I encourage you to check this out. Well, all for now, we'll see you next week.